Welcome to JS Podcast number 130. Hope you're all well. This is a great episode. I'm going to bring you a conversation with Carl Benjamin, aka Sargon of Akkad. A um, few things to unpack before this conversation. It's uh, mainly centered around the controversy we've seen with Patreon these last few weeks. Now, I did go into some detail on this in episode 129 with my interview with Jay Shapiro, which is great. By the way, check that out. But just to give you a very brief overview of the situation, it's very difficult to earn money as online content creators, unless you're exceptionally popular. And uh, for years, people have been grafting away and getting hundreds of thousands of views of their, their piece of content to earn a few quid here and there on advertising revenue. Um, so Patreon came along and said, you can ask people who appreciate your content to chip in as much as they want when they want and uh, this can help sustain you this can give you a a living wage if you get enough people to pledge a monetary amount to you and this was great this is something i did Uh, this is something i still do patreon was a great way for people who appreciate my podcast blog and and videos to say yeah that's worth a couple of quid a month to me thank you thank you very much Stephen. and you are welcome by the way you are welcome uh however it's it seems to be on the decline uh, now, not only as a platform, but me personally, because of recent events, uh, which I will explain. So, Carl, aka Sargon of Akkad, is a prolific YouTuber and content creator. I think he's got over, you know, he's got nearly 900,000 subscribers on YouTube. And he was on Patreon as well and earning a sizable wedge from that. And overnight, without warning, very recently, Patreon just completely deleted his page. He, he woke up to this news, in fact, and when we, I say we, I didn't have anything to do with it, but when people dug into it and finally got an answer from Patreon as to why they had made this decision, it's because they had found a clip of Carl speaking on a, another channel 10 months ago, and he'd used a few racial slurs and um, quote-unquote homophobic slurs in the direction of members of the alt-right to try and trigger them. This is his reasoning. Uh, so we'll we'll get into that on the podcast. Um, just to give you the full context, I'll read you exactly what he said. Well, not exactly. I'm going to have to self-censor uh, just in case I fall afoul of Patreon's new hate speech rules. He said, and I quote, he, and he says this to people uh, who align with the alt-right as he was arguing with them. He said, I just can't be bothered with people who choose to treat me like this. It's really annoying. Like, you're acting like a bunch of N-word. Just so you know, you act like white N-word. Exactly how you describe black people acting is the impression I get dealing with the alt-right. Then he goes on to say, Do you think white people act like this? White people are meant to be polite and respectful to one another, and you guys can't even act like white people. It's really amazing to me. So that sounds bad. That sounds really bad. When I first heard this in isolation, I thought, well, that's racist, isn't it? It's very racist. Uh, But there is some really important context to this, which we will go into. So it's kind of not only created a headache for a lot of content creators, it's created a rather large headache for Patreon because a lot of people saw this, they understood the context, or even they didn't understand the context, they just in support of absolute freedom of expression, um, have decided to start pulling their Patreon accounts down. People, big, big, big accounts on Patreon. Sam Harris, number, number, I think he was the 13th largest account on Patreon, just decided to close it because he uh, doesn't trust their safety and trust team to decide what is permissible to say and there's a lot of people who are being really i think thick thick is the word and it's not i don't know if it's intentional or they really do struggle with this concept but a lot of people are attacking people like sam who's taking a principled stand on this they're saying well why would you go to bat just for the right to say the n-word just to throw around just to throw around racial and homophobic slurs and that's not i mean sam doesn't speak like that i don't speak like that yeah i support Sargon on this because it's a slippery slope. It's one of them things where slippery slopes are usually logical fallacies. I just, I actually think in terms of regulating speech, um, slippery slope is one of them rare occasions where a fallacy is actually applicable. You, you, we've started to see it already. People have now been looking at Patreon's justification for banning Carl and saying, well, what about all these other accounts on your platform that are saying either the same thing or worse things surely you now have to turn your attention to them reminds me a little bit of um what happened with james gunn the 
ex-director of Guardians of the Galaxy films. He was, um, he's overtly left-wing, very anti-Trump, and spent, spent a lot of his time criticising Trump on, on the internet. And this is in a culture where there's a lot of emphasis on people from the left looking through your entire internet history and pulling things up and trying to get you fired, essentially, trying to publicly shame you. And uh, people on the right have, have seen how effective this, atta- this, this tactic is and, and thought, you know what, I want a piece of that. So they, they kind of frisked James Gunn's Twitter history and found some really off-colour jokes there, made a big deal of these, and uh, these jokes were made before he, he even signed an employment contract with Disney, and Disney saw these and they fired him, one of the most successful directors of a franchise in recent history. They fired him because of jokes he made before even working for, for Disney. So this is, people don't understand that these tactics open both ways and we're seeing that now because people are saying, well, what about, you see, because Carl's considered by the mainstream to be right wing, he's the bad guy, essentially. So it's, it's okay to get rid of him. But now people on the right or just people who like to point out hip- hypocrisy are finding left wing transgressors on Patreon and saying, why aren't you banning these? Why are you allowing this Antifa account to promote and endorse violence so it's a great headache for patreon a lot of big accounts are, are jumping ship in response to this because they just the trust has gone and that's had a trickle down effect to smaller accounts so i don't run around saying the n-word uh, using it as an insult at people um I, I don't really say anything particularly uh, offensive i'm not a provocateur i don't say things to get a rise i don't troll people uh but i've seen over a 20 percent reduction in my patron support uh, they drop like flies. It's like Thanos has just clicked his finger and they're, they're, they've gone. And uh, I've actually just stopped checking now because it's stressing me out too close to Christmas to, to keep seeing all this uh, support I've managed to accumulate over several years go in the blink of an eye because of a stupid, ridiculous decision made by Patreon. So the difference here is when someone gets banned from Twitter, it's no, no, no one really, I mean, we, we make a big deal out of it if someone's unfairly banned from Twitter, but nothing really happens because it's a Twitter account. What's happened here is this is someone's livelihood. This is someone's income. This is this is a big deal. And other people who earn their income and, and their livelihood through Patreon don't really like this. They don't take kindly to the, you know, overtly progressive overlords at Patreon policing language and deciding what is acceptable not only on their platform, but elsewhere. They've now decided they can look at something you have said anywhere and take it into account. So if I'm down the pub and I tell a really offensive joke and it's it's filmed or uh, I, I you know have an interview with somebody else and say something that is deemed quote-unquote offensive, patron can look on that and say, you know what, we're pulling your patron account as well. Uh, and it just seems quite Orwellian in a sense. So there's a lot of talk about an alternative being set up soon. Uh, I know Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson, are looking into doing that. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. I don't know how much this is going to affect me when the dust settles. We'll see in the new year. I do want to thank those of you who have taken a principal stand by deleting your Patreon contribution and then moving over to something like paypal that's that's really appreciated and that's really sweet to see people doing that because i didn't i didn't expect it um so thank you for that i'm gonna have to look at new ways to try and generate revenue i don't know uh we'll see how it goes but i get right into this on the podcast with carl and it's not that patrons shouldn't be able to ban people from their platform it's when they ban people unfairly and i think this is a very unfair politically motivated ban and uh we'll get into that in our discussion so there's a lot of mixed views on carl um i wasn't somebody who i mean i'd seen his context in the venn diagram of interest there's quite a bit of overlap so i'd see his videos on on topics that I was invested in myself, and he makes a lot of sense on that. I've also seen him be quite, you know, belligerent uh, and trollish, and you know, be- behaving ways which I, I don't think are great. Uh, but you know, that's his right. So I, he's a mixed bag, and I've spent a bit of time with him in Milwaukee this year, in fact. And I can't, you see, what when people talk about him and, and uh, build him up to be this huge pantomime villain if i if that was my personal experience i'd share that with you I, i'd tell you uh, if i saw him behave in any way questionable 
Uh, and bear in mind, I spent time with him when he thinks no one's watching in, in private, where he can be himself and let his guard down, and he, he was just a perfectly approachable, polite, friendly, nice guy. Uh, that's my personal experience. So when people get angry at me for talking to him, I um, I struggle to care, and I'm sorry to say that. It's, it's one of them things where I, I won't be goaded into having a conversation with anybody, and I, I won't be sort of shamed or bullied for, for having a, a conversation with anyone either. I mean, I'm, I'm producing conversations, I'm putting them out there, and you get to make up your own mind. I'm not going to tell you what to think about someone's opinions. I'm simply documenting them for you and uh, in, in, a, in a hope to progress the conversation. Um, so you can let me know what you think, by all means. You can check out Carl's YouTube channel, Sargon of Akkad, or not. It's up to you. It is up to you. But there's something you should know. And that's Sargon and people who produce this sort of alternative alternative media independently are becoming increasingly popular for a reason. And that's because a lot of people are noticing that there are certain narratives within the mainstream media, certain left-wing biases within reporting on events, and they're sick of seeing their viewpoints misrepresented. They're sick of being labelled with a derogatory term. They're sick of being told you're a deplorable, you're a right-wing fascist, you're an Islamophobe, you're a racist, you're a white nationalist, you're a white supremacist, you're a bigot, etc, etc. They're sick of hearing that. They're sick. I've been at rallies where I've I've spoke to some of the most reasonable people on the planet and then I'll open a, an opinion piece or a, or a headline in a, in a major newspaper that describes it as an alt-right or right-wing event and it's just not true and this is these these labels are often applied by people who aren't there to talk to people um so this is creating a trend where people want information from a different source they want someone who isn't pc who isn't going to toe to all your delicate speech codes and sensibilities and just say what they think and obviously at times carl takes it too far so i i personally if you care don't think he should be throwing around the n-word as insults in that manner. I think that's a bad move. I don't think he should do it. Uh, I, I think he deserves criticism for it. What I don't agree with is that he's a racist and that he deserves to be banned and have, you know, the main source of income completely stripped from him. So I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on this. You can find me on Twitter at gspellchecker. Uh, you can support the podcast, um, you know, if you want, if you're not jumping ship. You can you can find out more information where to do that gspellchecker.com forward slash support I, I do appreciate people who are hanging around on patreon i think that's still the best way f to fund my efforts personally so uh, if you are hanging around for that reason that's greatly appreciated if you can't um paypal is a great option uh if you can't do any of those things please leave a review on itunes or stitcher or wherever you listen to it that, that really helps the podcast grow make sure you share it around as well this is probably the longest introduction to a podcast ever. I apologise. Enjoy. There's a word that some folks find real hard to spell. Ain't it? I will pray except after say, who cares? You go burn in hell. But then along came a man. A spell took a prop of God who created and he set out upon a noble quest to help with those that don't know what it means. And he said, go pleased to welcome Carl Benjamin, aka Sargon of Akkad, to the JS podcast. Hi, Carl. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, very well. It's very nice of you to join me on. The, on, uh, I believe you've got a bit of downtime at the minute. Not much happening. Yeah, well, it's been kind of boring on the road to Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 been absolutely crazy of late, to be honest. Okay, so before we get into the particulars of your patron ban and the uh, the ripples that sent 
um, through other creators and people, you know, abandoning ship left, right, and centre. I thought I thought we'd uh, could take a few minutes just to talk about the state of conversation in general because um, you 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 hope have a lot of con- uh, conversations with people who are quote unquote controversial. I, I'll tend to speak to anyone really. I think um, I mean we both spoke to Tommy Robinson, for instance. Um, mm-hmm. But it makes people a lot of people unhappy when people sit down and talk. Uh, for some reason, I I know for a fact that when I decided to attend MythCon, a lot of people were unhappy that about that because you were there, mm-hmm. and uh, I know this conversation will upset a lot of people as well. And I, I just I just wonder what what's happening in terms of the conversation when a couple of people can't sit down and, and have a chat without people getting really tribal and angry about it. I think that it's because the tribes are basically delineated in such a way that they effectively try to nullify the entirety of one another's worldviews. And so if you are this thing, then you are entirely this thing. And if you are not this thing, then that tribe expects you to be entirely whatever it is they dichotomize themselves against. I think we saw this most exemplified with Ben Shapiro meeting Bill Maher. Now, I'm a fan of Bill Maher, and I have been for years. Like, you know, way back when I used to watch Jon Stewart, you know. Really, really big fan of Bill Maher, and still am. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a fan of Ben Shapiro's Trump coverage because Shapiro hates Trump for what he is—a big oafish doofus. <laughs> and Ben's a, Ben's a more fragile, shorter chap, <laughs> you know. I, and you can, you can see there's a kind of visceral dislike for Trump, but he also hates the Democrats. So I know if any of Ben Shapiro is defending Trump, then Trump's probably done something right that day. And in the conversation that he had with Bill Maher, he he sat down and Bill Maher said, I'm a Democrat. You're an always Trumper. And Ben Shapiro was like, no, I'm a sometimes Trumper. If Trump does something good, I like it. If he doesn't, I don't. And I think that's that's the real problem I have with the way the left is acting at the moment, because generally I don't get this kind of like treatment at all from the right, even from people who disagree with me. Like, I'm sure Ben Shapiro doesn't like me, disagrees with me, you know, thinks that I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm stupid and edgy and provocative on the internet, which isn't his style and fine. But he still said, look, you know, this deplatforming is wrong. This shouldn't have happened. This is, this is being done politically, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the same with Sam Harris. And the, these are the people I expect to be able to, even if, you know, for any, for any particular reason, these, these kinds of people, are the people I can sit down with. And even if I disagree, we can at least have a respectful conversation without, you know, without without either respective, like, fan base as well, becoming weird about it. And, like, the sort of cult mentality, no, you can't listen to a thing they've said. Because I think that, I, I really do think a lot of it is built on nullifying their entire worldview and delegitimizing everything they think. And so you fill it with an entire construct of your own. And, again, the reason I say this is because, for some reason, it drives, like a certain kind of leftist absolutely mad but i don't really know anything about climate change and so i just don't know what i I don't know and so i I just don't really have an opinion on it because i try to have an opinion on uh, not i try not to form an opinion on things that i just don't know anything about uh which leaves me open to many a gag about my feminist critiques but uh i'm actually really really confident about those so i'm not worried about that but um but this is this is the thing, like, and so it's it's a huge, huge topic that you'd have to. I mean, I don't know anything about science really, so I'm you know, I, I'm a total layman when it comes to that, and I would I would have nowhere to start, and I would have to start right at the beginning, and it would take years to develop a reasonable understanding of what's going on, and I just can't be bothered with it. I've got other things. Would I have you to um do. would you not look at the scientific consensus on something like that and well, think that they've probably got a hold on the situation? I, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even go into it. it I, I just say it's not my conversation. You guys make a decision without me, and I'll just go with whatever the decision that is made is, because it's just not something I understand well enough. But, but you, don't, you don't understand why some people might think that's a little bit fishy. Well, this is this is the attitude I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> what, what does that mean? Well, I mean, is there any other things in terms of scientific consensus that you just don't have an opinion on either way? It sounds like you're on the fence in terms of man-made climate change. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that climate isn't changing. It obviously is. I don't know whether it's caused by men or not. And this co- scientific consensus says yes. But there are certain things that make me not sure. And so I I just don't want to have an opinion on any of it. And I realize just saying that I'm not allowed to have an opinion. And this is what I think I'm talking about with the sort of like totalizing worldview. 
you know, you the the left is coming right. You must agree with this, or you're completely wrong. And or and with any of it, and honestly, I disagree with most of them on the way they view things generally. So obviously, I'm, I'm a terrible Arabic. Yeah, but, um, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, you don't get treated like this on the right, and we see this with what happened to someone like Mark. Meekan, uh, Count Dankula, with the fact that he gets a lot of criticism now for, uh, for, uh, for forming alliances with people on the right. And that's primarily because nobody on the left came to his aid when he was uh, basically um, arrested for making a, a joke video. Um, yeah, the, the comedians that came out in Dankula's defence were remarkably tepid, in my opinion. I was expecting more of a full-throated, are we actually finding a guy for telling a joke? Yeah. Uh, regardless of the kind of joke. But I think that goes to demonstrate the kind of degree to the left to which society has shifted. And I think that Jeremy Corbyn's stupid woman uh, comment <laughs> recently really exemplifies this. Because like, even if Jeremy Corbyn said stupid woman to, to about Theresa May in Parliament, that is not a sexist comment. That That is a demonstrable fact. And so... There's nothing wrong with him saying that unless we're saying that women can never be insulted because stupid woman is a really tepid insult. Again, it's really mild. You know, he, he, there are conservatives up and down the aisle that have called Labour MPs bitches and you can see them saying yeah, yeah. And things like that. It's, it's not like this is a, a, st a strong insult, but because this is the bed that Jeremy Corbyn made, now the conservatives are playing into it. And this is like, I think a lot of people's problem with the conservatives is that on, on social issues, there just seem to be labor light. I mean, you had, the other day you had Sajid Javid recommending that we extend hate speech laws to include ageism and I think it was disabledism or something. And I'm just like, no, we shouldn't be extending hate speech laws at all. We should be rescinding them because, you know, I don't think that people should be going to jail for offending people. I'm just a, I'm a radical that way, I guess. Yeah, no, I'm uh, definitely on the same page in terms of that, and I kind of agree that there's there's no genuine concern about uh, from the Tories about misogynistic language. I think they, like you say, they're just using that as a, a hammer to beat the opposition with, obviously. But talking yeah. of hate speech, that moves us very nicely onto what's just happened with Patreon, and mm. um, you, you've been shit canned from that platform. Basically, a, a sizable chunk of your income has now been completely wiped out overnight mm -hmm. and it was in response to a conversation you had i believe 10 months ago on a, on somebody else's channel and it wasn't even posted on patreon now i've seen the clip i saw the clip posted around by people using it to say here's a, a cast iron example of uh, carl being racist and in, in isolation out of context obviously you can you can kind of appreciate why people think that and um i just want you to try and explain who, who you were talking to on this live feed what exactly you said and what your intent was well the this incident came after about about a six month harassment campaign that me and my family had endured from i guess you would call them alt-right trolls but i'm not sure how actually alt-right they are right i i think they're just people who like to be edgy and they see alt-right morality and, and rhetoric as being the edgiest that they can find the least um palatable for any anyone in the mainstream um and so the, i think they kind of glom onto that movement because it provides them a space in which they can be exceptionally transgressive um but these people are also very aggressive and they um they've been just uh, just doing everything they could to hurt me in fact and the very fact that patreon even heard about this is because of their efforts it was as part of the and it's it's i mean it hasn't stopped it's obviously because i dare delineate my community from their own but um it hasn't stopped because they haven't really like they, they're intent on quote taking me down and they haven't managed it i think it's frustrating them um well just like to, sorry to jump in i mean a lot of people when they describe you in headlines and opinion pieces will describe you as a member of the alt-right and they, they seem unaware that you spend a lot of your time either arguing with the alt-right or, tr or trying to wind them up in various ways yeah that's because um our journalists are essentially demonstrable liars yes um the the associated press have a write-up that uh, comedian andrew doyle was passing around saying look there is a definition for alt-right and it means someone who wants a white only nation um i'm actually a child of mixed race i've got no interest in a white only nation but more than that i'm i'm opposed to fascism in its 
just in conceptually, you know, consequentially and procedurally, all of the things that make up fascism are things that I oppose on the grounds of effectively them creating big government. And I think it's immoral for the state to have this kind of control over the individual. So, I mean, I'm a, I, can, I call myself a classical liberal because that's genuinely how I see myself because that's genuinely what I think. I mean, I'm an individualist and I think that the individual is sovereign and the more that we can devolve control over one's own life to the individual, the happier and more prosperous society we're going to have. And in fact, that's one of my points of opposition to things like hate speech laws. I don't think the government should be able to police what I say to not make it offensive. I'm sorry. You're like, I mean, you watch the film Demolition Man. You've got like the bad guy in it is criticizing the 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 villain of the piece because the bad guy isn't actually the villain the villain is basically an sjw who wants to police everyone's language and the guy's like look you can't take away people's right to be assholes and i do think <laughs> no no and i think that's true though i think there is i think there is like an inherent right if you want to be offensive and transgressive you should have that option don't get me wrong there will be consequences but they shouldn't be legal consequences yeah. for offending people you know that's my problem and and again like everything everything i do basically comes from a libertarian framework i suppose in that way and so when people are like you're all right i'm just like no one has done more to fight the all right than me in this regard these these people have never spoken to any of these people they, they don't know they like they they can name richard spencer you know, or I can't even, I don't even remember the kid's name who did the, the who ran the woman over at Charlottesville or, or him, you know, they'll focus on one or two, but there are other ones that they don't deal with and they don't pay attention to. And yet they seem to think that like, we're like a gateway to it. And it's like, listen, dude, where is the alt right now? You know, where are they? They're nowhere. You don't see them on the internet. You'll see like the one comment on a comment section and then like 20 comments below with people going, oh, fuck off, Nazi. You know, it's <laughs> like nobody nobody has got time for their bollocks anymore. And I think it's because we went through the fire of it. You know, we've, we've been through it and now we've come out the other side. And this entire episode is in that context. And it, I, I'm going to be honest. I mean, you know, and this, the, I, they're going to mock me all over Twitter for saying this, but, you know, it was stressful. It's not easy to be on the re end, receiving end of this sort of thing. And uh, Didn't you have and, to call the police in at some point? Well, I, I, I kind of did, yeah, because they were trying to report me to the police for hate speech. Right. Obviously, it didn't work. Um, but I had to call the police and say, look, I'm sorry, but a bunch of spurgs on the internet are <laughs> trying to get me in trouble with the law. But that, again, just goes to show you the kind of laws we have in this country. I mean, these people are generally in America. So, you know, they don't have to worry about that. But I guess they don't have any scruples. So you're, you're in a live stream with these guys and you, you're arguing with them and you use what are termed racial slurs and homophobic mm. slurs as a, you know, you weaponize them against these people. And yeah. taken in isolation, this sounds like you're... Um, saying they're behaving, you know, you say the N-word, You be, I have to say the N-word now just in case patrons safe and trust Gestapo swoop on my podcast. Yes, you do. Uh, but you, you refer to them without that racial slur. You say you're acting the way you describe black people and um, go on to mention that, you know, are you supposed to be white? Aren't white people civilised? And uh, to the outsider who's not really um, got the time to unpack what's going on here, it sounds bad. And uh, what was you trying to do there? Well, I, I can believe it would sound bad, but I mean, I didn't expect it to be international news. <laughs> so I, I thought I was arguing with some alt-right trolls. Um, so, you know, you, could, you can see how this wasn't exactly a public statement that I thought I was making to the media and world at large. Sure. Um, but, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite ridiculous. Really. Um, but yeah, so basically the... the they couldn't accept a certain set of counter arguments. And so when when you're trying to persuade someone that their arguments are wrong, you have to understand their arguments, which means you have to be able to explain them as well as they would be able to explain them. And part of doing that is understanding the logic from which they use. They believe there is a social construct called white people. And this social construct of white people is like aliens that have come down from godlike aliens that have come down from space. White people are just this magical race that go around sowing good and harmony everywhere they go until the evil non-whites come along and ruin it all. And it's like, obviously, it's nonsense. But it's very much the sort of like... You know the hardcore black identitarians, the Wakanda forever types? Hmm. They say that white people are evil and did everything bad. It's exactly the mirror image of that. And it's it's just as ridiculous. And so I was just using their own logic. By their logic, they think that black people especially are just 
you know, degenerate and violent and all this sort of stuff. And these people are acting in an incredibly degenerate and aggressive way. I mean, the, the harassment campaign, frankly, had been amazingly childish in many ways. And it was unbelievably petty. And I don't even know why they're doing it, to be honest. I can only assume, like, I thought they thought they won the arguments. But the way they're acting, or what we're acting, we're not really doing it now. Well, a little bit. But, like, the way they were acting was so over the top i was thinking christ i must have gone to them in some way and honestly i mean like like, like i said this this was 10 months ago i mean where are they now yeah. so it, you know. it kind of reminds me of an extreme version of you know when you encounter someone who's a bit homophobic how it can be fun to imply in various ways that they might actually secretly like cock yes exactly that's exactly it <laughs> but I, and I, I realized that, you know, it's it's dangerous rhetoric to be using in a time like that. But I was quite stressed out. I mean, you can hear it in my voice. Yeah, it's sure. Quite on edge. Um, and it, I, it, it was something that they wouldn't be able to just say no to, you know. They, they, can, they can say no all they want, but demonstrably, you know, they would use the term chimping out. And that was what they were doing. And... I mean, honestly, it felt really great to point out that, look, you are you are at least as bad, if not worse, as the worst stereotype that you hold over non-white people. You are you're as bad demonstrating that the white race is no better than them or any. You know, it's exactly the same. You know, it has as good points as bad points, blah, 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 you know. And I, I mean, I thought that made the point, to be honest. I guess it was just really offensive to some people. Yeah, so so what's happened here? I mean, obviously, this is part of a campaign in a sense because people at Patreon have, have found this couple of seconds within a, I think it might have been a three-hour conversation that happened yeah. 10 months ago and, and have, have acted on that. And that kind of feels politically motivated in, in terms of the way they've expressed their policies before in terms of only acting on things that are posted on Patreon because obviously this wasn't posted on Patreon. So mm -hmm. what? What's going on here when you have uh, people in Silicon Valley who are policing speech in a way that's not even handed and it, it, it comes across quite targeted in a sense? Well, that's the question, isn't it, really? Um, the whole debacle with Patreon, I mean, in the end, they they gave me the reason that they were judging against my brand. And that I found very strange uh, because I've been on Patreon for four years and they've actually always been really even handed up mm. until I would say, well, recently. Um, they've always been really even handed and I've always had a really good relationship with the people I've spoken to there. It's always been really cordial, very polite and very, um, not, not, not just professional, but like decent um, rather than the kind of, what you know the sort of tone of malicious compliance that comes out of them now as in you know no these are our corporate rules and therefore we can do them to the you know x degree nth degree in order to get rid of someone that whose brand we don't like it's like well my brand has always been politically incorrect i mean from the very start of my channel you know the point was look i don't care about political correctness so how about i think feminism's cancer etc cetera, etc cetera. um and they had no problem with that for years until very recently when i guess they must have felt financially secure enough to be able to do this um because as you say i mean it's previously acknowledged by jack conte that the rule about hate speech only applies on patreon and then he had a conversation with tim paul that tim paul released in which he acknowledged that the the wording of the the terms of service do actually say that and they should change that and get on that and so it's like right so you you know that that's what it says. You know that a reasonable interpretation is that it's on Patreon. And after this has happened, you accept that you need to change the wording as it is because it doesn't tell people that this is about your brand off Patreon. So, I mean, as far as I can tell, that's Jack Conte saying that I've done nothing wrong and, and they've broken their own terms of service and not followed it in the least. And they seem to be just doubling down. And the, the statement they made to Business Insider was demonstrably false in many ways. And I was just like, wow, so they're actually spinning a narrative about this. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the the worst things about this for me as well is the fact that you you can you woke up essentially to chatter of the fact that your page had gone P you, people noticed this before oh, you yes. had i mean that was your i mean they hadn't contacted you they hadn't sent you an email uh it's just your that income's gone overnight and uh you're in shit creek really and i, I was just wondering if they had have emailed you and said look we've heard this we're not particularly happy about it what's the chances of you not saying these kind of things in the future what would your response to that have been a uh, very mild i would imagine um the yeah i mean like you say i woke up about 10 o'clock in the morning and 
my phone was just exploding, obviously, and everyone's like, those bastards, and I was like, oh, shit. But actually, to be honest with you, <laughs> the, the, a part of me was just like, they've deleted my Patreon, haven't they? Because it happened not long after the Milo deletion, so uh, which, again, was unjust. Um, but, um, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> so, I mean, if they'd have just uh, tried to, okay. in, in essence, slap you on the wrist. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, if they'd, if they'd sent me an email saying, look, this has been brought to our attention, we'd like to talk to you about it, can we talk to you about it? I would have essentially explained myself like I have here and said, so this is the context of it. I'm I'm not of the opinion, like, like I don't know, I'd, I, I guess I'd be like, look, I don't think that black people are N-words, you know? I don't think that that's the case. So if I use the N-word, I'm using it as like a set of, like, the, in the behaviors, it's like, this is this is why I use the Chris Rock example because he's deli- distinguished as a set of behaviors, yeah. and a kind of culture, and I think that he's right. You know, I think that is what well, it's describing. It's he's describing a, a a subculture effectively. I don't think it's racial, to be honest. I actually think that this is a sort of like a sort of degenerate young man sort of culture. Uh, but any, anyway, I would have explained myself, and I would have said, well, I mean, what way could I have? You know what? What would you like me to do? It's not on my channel. I can't delete it, obviously. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say, okay, I will not use the N word. It is just too offensive for everyone. You know, I, I would have agreed to any terms, but they didn't do this. They deleted my account, and then the next day emailed me. I think it was. Um, so I had to wait for quite some time to find out just what I'd done wrong. In, in your gut, do you? Um, I mean, I'm asking you to wade into like unknowns and conspiracies here but is it is it a possibility that a they're getting pressure from payment providers to get rid of certain people uh b it's just some overzealous staff member who's made a mistake and now they can't dial it back uh what, what do you think's more likely here um i think there are times when payment processors do put pressure on patreon and other companies like it um but these seem to be for avowed or open white nationalists um they don't i don't think i would be on their radar for that um i think that this has been the result of the trust and safety team because jack conte even with his private message with tim pool he was still giving a consistent like an un- he was still accepting that the the terms of service were as they were interpreted in previous years, whereas the trust and safety team are just making up an interpretation of the rule. They're not applying one that can be realistically read from the terms of service. And yet the the official stance of Patreon, this is why Jan Conte isn't making public statements and we, we have to rely on a leak. Um, it. The, the official stance of Patreon is just that, no, we've we've made our decision and we're sticking to it and we don't care that people know that we're lying, you know, or we're yeah. deliberately doing this. And so, yeah, it does it does feel particularly targeted. And it, it seems weird that they're prepared to take um, what I suppose now is quite a large financial hit. Um, I don't know why they'd be doing it other than political differences that I would have with people from Silicon Valley who are very – progressive and very far to the left in my opinion um and i think honestly that they target people who they view as effective at challenging their ideology and i think that's why milo was taken off i think that's why james also was taken off i think that's why i've been taken off i mean it was bad enough after they got rid of your page there was a lot of commotion online a lot of reaction a lot of people getting rid of their patron accounts and then they released a, a statement a detailed statement of their policy on hate speech, which just made everything a million times worse for them, as far as I can see. I mean, they've they've just basically announced that they don't understand freedom of expression and they certainly don't support it. Yeah, and they're prepared to be like Orwellian dictators over your life if they're judging your entire brand online. There's and like it wasn't on my stream or anything, so it's not like my patrons even knew I was there. It like I hadn't posted it on Patreon. It was just something I was doing in my private time. Because someone asked me to go on a stream and talk about liberal philosophy, in fact. Um, so I was doing this as a, just because I wanted to. It wasn't that I was being paid to do that. And yet they were like, right, no, we're funding your entire online brand. So it's like, my goodness. You know, they're, they're essentially trying to take control of everything I do, which I think is terrible, frankly. I think that's, that's really bad. But I mean, I don't think this would have been as bad as it was if Subscribestar hadn't been targeted by what looks very much to me like a kind of moral cartel. Just explain what Subscribestar is to people who who might not know. So, yeah, so Subscribestar is a Patreon alternative. It's been going for, I think, probably about 10 months or something. Um, And 
like there's a, a YouTuber called Naomi Wu, who's a big YouTuber, and she's been funding her engineering channel uh, through this for since May, I think it was, since she was banned from Patreon, in fact. Um, and so she's been using this platform just fine. And so when Patreon decided to close my account, I was like, okay, well, I'll start an account on Subscribestar. And a lot of other people opened accounts on Subscribestar. And a lot of money started flowing from Patreon to Subscribestar. And then for some reason, PayPal decided to remove their ability to process payments with them. And that seems like cartel behavior to me. I mean, what possible reason would they have? I mean, like, what did Subscribestar do wrong? Yeah. It, PayPal had no problem with Patreon, like, the day before, taking money and processing money for me. There was no problem there. I haven't lost my PayPal account, so I don't see what the problem is there. But if a bunch of us move to Subscribestar, now Subscribestar are not allowed to process through Patreon, even though they've been doing it for like six months. How is that anything other than like a protectionist policy from PayPal to other Silicon Valley payment and like big tech in Silicon Valley? Because PayPal and Patreon's headquarters are only a few hundred meters away from each other. Jack Conti said in his chat with Dave Rubin, oh, yeah, we're all very open. All of the tech, the CEO tech of the tech giants all talk to each other. We share. It's a very open and sharing community. And I'm like, fucking hell, man. How am, I how am I supposed to look at this as if it's not a deliberately sort of targeted in a kind of like Rockefeller standard oil way, you know, where they're just ruining their competition to maintain a monopoly? Because that's what it looks like. It's the lack of transparency that's really frustrating as well. They won't open. I mean, what what I appreciate about Patreon when they first launched is they seem to be quite open in the way they operate. I was quite impressed mm -hmm. when Jack Conte went on Dave Rubin's show to, to discuss exactly why he'd banned someone because we never get a straight answer. We usually get a cop, cut and paste, uh, yeah. you know, email or something. So, I mean, I, I assume they were different, but it turns out like they are, now they've got, you know, like they've been able to support themselves. Now they've become quite regressive in their, in their attitudes. But... I wanted to get what you make of, um, I mean, Sam Harris, I think, was the first big account. I think he was probably the 13th big account. I read somewhere on, on Patreon yeah. who released a statement to say that he, he can't trust them to oversee his finances for his podcast anymore in the light of your banning. He didn't reference you directly, but obviously it was uh, yeah, definitely yeah. a response to that. And I think you two have probably had a, a fair few disagreements in the past as well from I've, speaking I've to you. I've spoken to them, man. Yeah, but I think I've heard you speak about him. Sorry, in terms of um... oh, I'm, a, I'm a great admirer of Sam. I think he, I, I, you know, I go to watch his live shows where he's debating Jordan Peterson. I went to see one in London. Um, I, I had a great time. I think it was Peterson, Douglas Murray, and Sam Harris on stage talking philosophy. So I, I was having a whale of a time actually. Um, I wish there was more time for questions. To be honest, for I mean, obviously for Sam to do that is an unbelievably principled thing to do. Um, for to, to to just speak out in defense of someone that you don't really approve of, but who you think is being in unjustly treated, is a decent thing to do in itself, you know. But to shut down, I mean, it must have been like fifty thousand dollars a month he was making, and I mean, I, you know, I, he's not a man who's hurting for money or anything, but still, that's, I mean, that's a that's a real statement of principle and demonstration of principle right there, in my opinion, and so. I, <laughs> He just shot up in my estimation, I suppose. You know, yeah, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, the, I mean, I forgot to say before, actually, but um, just before we go on, um, the lady who is running the trust and safety team at Patreon uh, spent eight years working at PayPal, which um, which is very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I believe her LinkedIn profile has gone up in smoke now, hasn't it? Yes, the the LinkedIn profile was deleted very quickly for some reason, but not before people got screenshots. And so she's a Silicon Valley e-commerce expert who started in, Patre uh, in PayPal and is now working for Patreon and is now the one making the decisions. It's it's all very incestuous there. Um, but sorry, what was the question again? Well, uh, yeah, so I mean, what were your thoughts on basically Sam Harris? He, he's, I mean, you can't have expected the amount of support you've had, maybe even if indirectly with a lot of people like people like, you know, Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson have responded to this. A lot of the big online magazines from Claude Quillette and various others and, you know, um, video game um, uh, patron pages have started pulling the plug on people from all kind of, because I don't, I don't think patron kind of um, accounted for the fact that this would have a ripple down effect to people who aren't even politically engaged or aren't, you know, quote unquote controversial. It seems to have affected a lot of people who, who are in no way linked to intellectual discussion or, or politics as well 
Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've got to thank all of the members of the intellectual dark web. Um, Joe Rogan, Gadsad talked about it the other day. PewDiePie um, defended me in his video that he put out today. In fact, you know, millions of people have doubtless seen that by the time they'll listen to this. Um, I honestly, I'm and and Sam Harris closing his Patreon account um, I, because of Patreon's terrible policies. Like, it's it's amazing, and I'm genuinely grateful to everyone for not staying silent because i think that if we don't speak up now they're going to know that they can just do this and there will be no consequences because it's not like they haven't done this well like i said with naomi Wu, she she had apparently got into a, a cultural conflict between her and vice because of different mores between china and america but that was enough patreon didn't care they didn't take any of this into account they shut her account um with Lauren Southern, I mean, you know, everyone was like, well, okay, manifest observable behavior, but now we're down to policing words. So, I, I mean, it's it's an incredible thing. It's just an incredible thing to watch. And it's, I really hope that the people who are making solutions to this, I, I realize that there are massive problems because basically um, PayPal is off the table, obviously. Yeah, that's going to be my uh, next question. How can you produce a viable alternative if you're still at the behest of all the, you know, the the standard paymasters in that way? Yeah, that's the main problem. I mean, like when uh, when there was the synagogue shooting, I can't remember what was it Pittsburgh uh, synagogue sh- shooting. Um, but the the old right guy who posted on Gab, um, for some reason, that made Gab liable for what he'd done or something in the eyes of the sort of establishment. And so the the website hosters started cancelling Gab's hosting, and it took them a, a couple of weeks to get back online properly. Um, but now Andrew Torbo, who is the creator of Gab, is I, I believe that they're all kind of in talks with one another, all of alt text, we've got Minds, BitChute, all of these, and, you know, places that have been deplatformed. I don't know how closely they're talking, but they, considering, like, trying to start up some kind of effectively alternative internet, because it's, at this point, Silicon Valley really has a stranglehold on the internet. It's really difficult. I mean, like, people are like, well, use Bitcoin. It's like, well, okay, how do I get the Bitcoin into my bank? Well, you need to use some kind of uh, middleman. And like who? Well, Coinbase. Well, Coinbase is located in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you start really running out of options because one one company will produce a product that does something well and they'll gain a remarkable market share. And if they're in Silicon Valley, apparently their neighboring companies will act, actually act in their interest and sabotage their competitors. This happened with Hatreon, which was a sort of like a cultural meta response to Patreon deplatforming the alt right, which happened a couple of years ago. But again, no one, no one spoke out, I suppose. Uh, the noose has been tightening this whole time. Um, but that was shut down for the same reason by stripe and paypal um then you had maker support which was a, just a neutral competitor to patreon they they were just like well you know i mean we have free speech policies so we're not going to police your speech but um obviously only within the law there's you know we're going to act within the law and it was a very clean and nice looking site and of course stripe were like well okay we're going to pull out then and it's just like right so they're, they're, they're actively shutting down their opponents it's not a free market how um, damaging do you think this whole episode will, will turn out to be for Patreon in the long run? Is this something they can just ride out? Is it is this something that they'll, uh, you know, it might spell the end of the way they operate uh, as they are? I, I honestly don't know. And I mean, this people forget that we're still in the really early years of the internet. Um, and so the sort of social phenomenon that the, the phenomena that the internet generates uh, are going to have strange effects that i don't think were previously felt in society um and i mean this kind of thing is one of them really the, this kind of thing was always very localized but this is very broad um they, you know this is people from everywhere that are paying attention to this and so i i honestly i honestly don't know but i mean i think it's getting worse for patreon the longer they just refuse to accept that there is another side to the argument because again this whole like well no we don't believe that anything you've said is legitimate it's like look hundreds of thousands of people are angry about this you don't hundreds of thousands of people don't tend to get angry about something unless there is at least a kernel of truth to it but patreon's response is no there's no legitimacy to this so we're not going to listen you're all wrong we're right and that's it and you can't make us do anything and i think that's the root cause of why people effectively revolt um 
I, like I said, I don't, I don't know where it's going to go. I'm not encouraging people to shut their accounts or anything. Um, I obviously don't have an account, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I can't get an account anywhere else because of actions of companies that work closely with Patreon. But, you know, in, in, the, in the near future, I'm hoping the, uh, the intellectual dark web and alt tech will work closely together and get something up and uh, hopefully secure the funding to get that sorted. And the thing is, then, then we can actually have a viable market competitor. And I guess we'll see how the market decides, won't we? Yeah. So, I mean, you're down a Twitter account as well, aren't you? I mean, uh, uh, there's a few myths about what led to that there. What, what Basically, um, what, what did you do to get in trouble there? What sort of garbage human behaviour was you up to? Uh, I was challenging the alt-right again. <laughs> see, I think I've figured out your problem. Yeah, I know. I shouldn't do it because <laughs> I'm the one who gets in trouble and they get away with it. And uh, But the thing is, I, I think that it matters more for like... You know, because when, when, when you post anything to the internet, right, you, you always get like, you know, if I put up a video up and I get like 250,000 views on it, like I'll get something along in the line of like 20 to 30,000 likes or dislikes, just interactions there, and then about 5,000 comments. So that's hundreds of thousands of people who saw it but didn't interact with it. They just enjoyed the content or whatever. Um, and I think it's the same with all of your interactions on the internet, basically. I think thousands more people see them than react to them. And so you forget that you have a large audience. And I think that, you know, you, you can say, well, this was was not successful for whatever reason. But at the end of the day, I don't think the alt-right is very big and I don't think it's growing very well. I think their philosophy is generally unpopular and they know it. Hmm. And so I think they're kind of, I th- honestly, I think they're moderating themselves. I, I still speak to one or two like people in the alt-right, like individuals who I'm like personally friends with. And, um, I, they, they've seemed a lot more moderate to me of late, which is good. I think any kind of moderating influence on Nazis is probably a good thing. That's you know anything stops them from radicalizing. Um, obviously, this isn't a universal thing, as we saw from the Pittsburgh shooting, but um, mm. you know it's some it's something, isn't it? Yeah. Well, to- so. talking of influence, I mean, you're you're prolific in your in your output, and you um you you obviously you delve into political philosophy a lot as well, so you can be quite serious and straight. By your own admission, you can sometimes uh, engage in trollish type behaviour to be provocative, and I just, right. I just thought, I mean, what's the um, effectiveness of being provocative? Do you think uh, versus just being a straight arrow in that sense? Do you think you can create a little bit too much heat when you, it's easy to create light? I mean, you, some of the things you say, you must know it's going to piss off possible yeah. allies at the same time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, obviously. If, if I'm the the thing is the problem of being an activist primarily through YouTube is the lack of direct influence in the political process. So even if I have criticisms of policies or politicians or philosophies, nothing really has to change. And I'm kind of just shrieking into the wind. Um, And so part of being an effective activist is understanding your opponent's ideologies and pressing the right buttons to expose the contradictions in their ideologies, expose the way that it's going to make them act in a tyrannical manner, frankly, because I think most of the things that I'm concerned about is essentially tyranny. And it seems to be the way we're going. I mean, look at the moment with article 13, it may be that YouTubers in Europe lose the ability to use YouTube and nobody seems to be thinking about the consequence of that. So I assume that what that means in the same way with Brexit, that it's all kind of they they, they say it, but they're never going to do it. Um, but we don't know because now the legislation is actually tabled. So even if it's even if it's just like, well, we were just bluffing. It's like, well, what about the next guy who isn't bluffing? You know, we're we're setting ourselves up for for this kind of thing. And so what I need to do is to make sure they can't just ignore me. Because the problem with the internet is it's very easy to just block someone, which incidentally, for example, the Jess Phillips tweet, which my goodness, I didn't realize I could be so effective with one tweet. I honestly didn't. I honestly didn't realize. Right. But I tell you, what, I, I love the I wouldn't even meme that's come out of it. It's it's so great. It's one of my favorite things. But I, I knew she already had me blocked. So I knew she wouldn't see this tweet anyway. And I knew that there was no way that it could be construed as a threat. So I knew that all it would do is piss people off and I would still be technically correct. And, <laughs> and but it showed everyone what kind of people. And the, the, the whole point, I, the whole point of that was to say, look, 
even if I say I'm not going to do something, you're just going to pretend I said I did something. And that's exactly what happened the next day. Look at all these rape threats. You could go through a time when there was not one. It was all people just joking and saying, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't either. I wouldn't either. You know, being dicks, don't get me wrong, total dicks. But at the time, she was trying to get some kind of centralized government control of the internet in the hands of her feminist sisterhood, as she describes it in her book. You know, it's like, no, look, I'm sorry. I just don't trust these people to have this kind of control. And if they can just ignore me, then I have to make it so they kind of can't just ignore me. Because I think the ostracization is really the problem that we're having entirely with societies. I think that all of these shootings are caused by weirdo loners. I mean, the Parkland shooting, right, was Emma Gonzalez or whatever. There was a part, a, a clip of her on the stage justifying bullying and ostracizing the kid who went on the shooting. And it's like, look, man, I'm sure that he was awful, right? But making it so he can never get any better is kind of guaranteeing that something bad is going to happen. And yet we're stuck in this culture of ostracization on moral purity. Oh, well, that person offended me. Therefore, good sir. It's like, no, no, you, this is a terrible idea. And I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so I think we we need to stop thinking how we don't talk to people. And unfortunately, making them react to what I'm doing is unfortunately part of the strategy. I mean, if if, if anyone wants to come and have a, a serious conversation with me like this, I'm more than happy to have a, a calm conversation and just explain myself in full. But that's not what they're looking for. So, Yeah. Well, I mean, you mentioned Jess Phillips there and we're talking about the way in which you know, speech is becoming increasingly more regulated in the UK. It's very difficult to explain this to a lot of our American cousins. I think they look at it with with horror in terms yes. of in terms of what the police are knocking on doors for and um, what what may be a, a criminal offence now in regards to what you tweet or put out on Facebook. And it seems to me that, and this goes back to the whole left versus right thing again, but the left seems to have won the culture war. I think our society is overwhelmingly left or at least liberal in, or, you know, ostensibly. Yeah, progressive is a yeah. better word. Uh, but it seems that their attitudes to speech seem increasingly more conservative and they don't seem to realise this for some strange reason. The, the society feels more conservative in regards to speech and it, it feels like uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fair bit of a regression and it's quite frightening. It is strange to watch Muslims wearing, uh, feminists, sorry wearing hijabs yes like, it, like it's so weird to me to see that like what are you doing there are women in iran who are being persecuted by the government for taking these off what are you doing yeah but i mean you know the west is terribly oppressive and muslims are intersectionally oppressed and so the hijab is actually a liberating garment blah 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 yeah it's worth quite a lot on the intersectional bingo card isn't it hijab it's amazing, muslim isn't it it's yeah. amazing. But I mean, so uh, what What issue are we having here where police are sending out warnings to people about being careful about what they put online, where we're seeing, I said, I read something that, like record numbers of people are being hauled into the police station. Some yeah. young lady was prosecuted for posting rap lyrics a while back. So, I mean, yeah. what, how has this happened? Uh, the far left, the progressive left. It's because no one has an argument against them because the conservatives have lost all moral spine. Um, they, they were, they were, like, it's popular in middle-class bourgeois circles to hate Margaret Thatcher. But on some subjects, she was absolutely woke. And one of them <laughs> was the power of the state and effectively the kind of socialist mindset um, of increasing government control. And these people don't have any compunctions about this. They, they view themselves as the people controlling the government, imposing their rules to engineer their better society. And I don't think that they should be given that kind of responsibility. And you see this everywhere. Like, it's amazing how unbelievably progressive Britain is as a country. Like, Scotland's government recently used Scottish taxpayer money to propagandise the Scottish people about transphobia because ah. polls show that Scottish people are generally not in favour of children trans uh, transitioning from one gender to another. And it's like, well, who the hell is? Well, radical ideologues who think that there's no barrier and it's all there's there's no biological difference between the genders and it's all a patriarchal construct, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, but why are these why are these people controlling Scottish government policy? Why them? And it's it's because they're total institutionalists. They'll do the brown nosing that no one else wants to do. 
Okay, so you seem, I mean, you seem very frustrated with the main two parties, uh, as most people are, as I am, but you seem to have hitched your wagon to UKIP. And, you know, I'm not um, overtly familiar with UKIP in terms of their policies. To me, previously, they'd always seemed like a party run by clownish figures, which is why I could never seem to get on board. I think I um, I saw Batten speak at the Day for Freedom, and he he seemed to speak sense to me there, but obviously I don't know the entire body of his work. So, I mean, what's, what's drawn you to the UK independent? party you're racist you're massive racist <laughs> at first it was kind of a meme it was dan, dan killer just messaged me one day and goes right should i should i put out this tweet if i get 500 retweets i'll join ukip and i was like dude that's funny because we like we were we've been gnashing our teeth not being able to get involved with anything seriously political um and no you know no one wants to join the labor or the conservatives god um and so I was like, dude, 500, make it 10,000 or something. And uh, and so we watched this just get 10,000 retweets. And he's like, right, okay, I've gone and done it. I was like, you know, fuck it, why not? And then Paul Joseph was, I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I was like, okay, great. And then Milo got in and it's like, why not? You know, so and, it, and then, is and this then Carl the Troll out. trying to be provocative or is, do you have a sincere belief well, in the, well, the policies of UKIP? Well, I think it's more the, the worldview of UKIP I have a more sincere belief in. Um, I, I very, I'm a very big fan of Nigel Farage. Um, I, like, I like his attitude towards Brexit. I like his attitude towards the European Union. And he's actually quite woke on a number of other subjects, like the problem that social justice is producing in college campuses. Hmm. Um, he, he's, he's like, the, I think I would describe like a traditional sort of English sort of classically liberal attitude rather than necessarily the individual policies is essentially like one of independent like personal self-confidence you know like when when Farage described himself like you know 25 years ago I decided I was going to get Britain out of the European Union you're not laughing now so yeah that's that's a that's a very empowering philosophy that he's espousing there he decided he was going to get off his ass stop being a, a trader or whatever he was and then just go and do it and then he did it. And so, you know, I can see why he retired after afterwards. And and I, I I genuinely believe that that sort of philosophy too. I think the empowerment of society against the state is better than this the empowerment of the state against society. Because I think that that like letting people be free will unleash their creative activity. Whereas putting things under government control generally tends to stifle them. And what happens when, once the once the, the giant leaps have been made and now it needs to be homogenized. Um, and so I, I, I think we definitely need to have less government interference in a lot of things. I mean, again, with hate speech laws, personal interaction is one of those things. Um, and, and that's the general philosophy of UKIP. And this is – I've always quite liked this. And like ages ago, these, these, this guy at UKIP rally endorsed my channel when I had, I don't know, like 100,000 subscribers or something. And I was just uh, – sorry, an EDL rally. Not that they're the same thing, but it was just like, why would he be endorsing me? You know, like I've I've openly opposed like the far right. So I think that a lot of these people are being misrepresented. I, I mean, I don't even know what far right is supposed to mean anymore. Like, it's, it does, yeah, I, it's, it's what I, you I, use in a headline when you can't be asked to do some groundwork. I um. I used to, I've been to a few rallies. I've been collecting video interviews I've been doing of people with Kekistan flags because mm-hmm. I was told this, uh, you know, the Kekistan flag is uh, a celebration of white nationalism. It's basically <laughs> you're, you're, a, you're a bigot. So I, I, no joke, being fairly funny, be, being fairly naive, I, I took it upon myself to interview everybody with one of these flags because I thought in my head, this is going to be great because I can argue with a racist on camera and this yeah, this will yeah. be great. And Everyone I spoke to, the, when I mentioned white nationalism, they looked at me like I was an alien, you know. And <laughs> and I've I've got a big collection. I've got seven or eight people uh, from various rallies that I've interviewed on this, and they, they all told me the same thing. No, we just we're just mocking identity politics, uh, essentially. So there, there seems to be, and you're probably got your finger on more on the post than than, than me. And this there seems to be um, a huge emerging shit posting culture that the the mainstream media are either unwilling to understand or are just so far behind it they can't comprehend it and that leads to uh to be charitable a lot of misunderstanding yeah i mean a lot of the a lot of the controversy surrounding me is basically stemming from that misunderstanding um i mean a lot of what i do is laced in irony obviously uh so i mean i think the i think the important thing is to remember that the words that you use only have the intent that is put behind them 
That's the that's all that the person who says them can do. And if they're saying them in a specific context with a specific intent and you're deciding to remove that context and apply your own intent, then it doesn't really matter what they've said because you could probably turn anything into something you find offensive at that point. Um, and you're removing the ability for people to play with these things. I think a lot of people like playing with words um, in many different ways. Kind of like, like it's it's honestly kind of similar to the kind of pun culture of Monty Python, you know, where it's, it's like funny puns and things like this. And it's something similar to that. <laughs> um, but you, I, but basically it's the fun police. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of these are kids. Uh, I, I say kids, yeah, the, you know, young teens, kids, yeah. early twenties. But I mean, what was really interesting, I, I, I saw one guy at the day for freedom rally and he had a MAGA cap and uh, a Kekistan flag. I thought, well, I have to speak to him. And oh, yes. I, I rocked over and at first he was English, very, very well spoken, actually, very well educated. <laughs> and uh, I was asking him about his flag and his hat. And he, he says he doesn't care about Trump. He doesn't know anything about Trump. He just knows it winds up the left. And as I was interviewing and asking him, is he, is he not scared about being misrepresented? Somebody else is taking a picture of me interviewing him. And uh, I checked Twitter an hour or so later and hope not hate have tweeted out that image denigrating that young lad as yeah. you know an alt-right far-right fascist you know choose whatever you want so here's a here's a guy who's just there to take the piss and a big far left interest group is now denigrating him denigrating him online to the world as some sort of right-wing fascist and it just yep. seems deeply not only unjust but very very lazy at the same time it, well it's deeply dishonest yes it's just a lie you know they they don't know anything about that man and and even then those symbols again and Anyone who isn't like a far leftist or has only been exposed to the words of the far left on this, um, anyone else would be like, well, no, they, these these are, I mean, mo like it's not just white people who like this, you know. So it's 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 a deliberate lie, and I think that they do it to because they they use these terms as, I mean, effectively as dog whistles to 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 say that these people are outside of the tribe. Um, that's why they, I mean. Thunderfoot got called alt right the other day. <laughs> Thunderfoot, and it's like the Hillary Clinton supporting Thunderfoot is part of the alt right, and it's like this is ridiculous. You know, they're they're just using it to say not one of our guys, and what they mean is not someone who's protecting political correctness and intersectionality and all this. That's what they mean. Okay, so last thing I'll um, I've stole plenty of your reading off you already. So the last thing I'll bring up, which shouldn't really cause any controversy whatsoever, is Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, are we heading towards a big fat no deal? Do you think? Fingers crossed. So you think? Do you think that would be favourable? Oh god, yeah. So is this god in terms yeah. of the the monetary value, or do you, you? I mean, do you not think it might have other repercussions economically? Well, I, I should hope it has repercussions economically because the European Union is a shrinking percentage of global GDP. Being hitched to this thing is probably a bad idea in the long run. And yeah, sure, in the short term, it might hurt. There might be some pain, but you know, stiff up a lip. Come on. <laughs> um, no, no, I'm not. I'm not joking. I think this is. I think the way that the country it, and honestly, the Remainers in particular, that it's disgraceful the way they are repeatedly letting the european union embarrass our country i think that's terrible i mean the point where may effectively went on her knees and they told her not good enough and if you don't just do what we want we're not going to renegotiate and it's just like dude at this point if anyone treats you this way you tell them that they get nothing and you walk away they want 39 billion pounds off of us the european union is not exactly the most stable entity at the moment i don't know whether anyone's noticed hmm. like how many right wing parties like by the time the european union's finished it's going to be a, a ukip project you know it's going to be taken over by the five star movements and all of these types from all across the the continent so it's just like, I, I don't know what they think they're doing. Yeah. Well, here's a, here's an awful thought experiment to consider, I suppose. So obviously we've got uh, Theresa May negotiating on by our behalf. I say negotiating. She's... Um... She's a She's Remainer. Negotiating for the European Union. Yeah, yeah, that, that's how it feels. She slipped the other day. Yeah. Um, so, and then in essence, I think we all know that um, Corbyn's uh, closet lever. Do you yep. think he, if he was in charge, would inadvertently get a better deal for the country? No, I think he would drive a harder bargain than May, to be honest, um, because it's not really possible to drive a softer bargain than May. Um, <laughs> but the, I think I the problem the problem that they have is they have this kind of weird groupthink in Westminster, where the idea of not leaving with a deal, of leaving without a deal, sorry, is just 
it, it's a, a cataclysm. It's it's the end of the world, and it's like no one outside of Westminster thinks that's going to happen. Like the head of the World Trade Organization doesn't think there's going to be any disruption. Like the ex uh, le, uh, minute, um, ex uh, head of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, he doesn't think there's any problem. He thinks that a World Trade Organization Brexit would be the best thing anyway, because as uh, was it Tony Abbott, the ex Prime Minister of Australia, points out. We can just make a bunch of unilateral decisions. I mean, A, we'll be £39 billion up. And B, we can just say, right, okay, what do we want? Like, we're not going to enforce a hard border in Ireland, so then it's up to the EU. Are they going to do it? No, of course they're not. So no Mm -hmm. change there, you know. We're not going to change our terms and standards for whatever trade we do from them. So we can do world trade organizations. That will carry on as well. Okay, things might go up slightly in price. Yes, that will be terrible. Some jobs are lost. Yes, okay, it's all going to be rough. But then there are things that they can do. For example, it's not popular with the left, obviously, but you can cut corporate tax and encourage investment here. With the number of people who are just leaving to go back to the continent anyway, wages are rising in certain industries and job um, unemployment is going down. So it's not like there aren't demonstrable economic benefits that can be gained from this if we just make the right moves. And, yeah, like we're in a really strong position, and it's so weird watching Remainers talk about the European Union as if it's this monolith that can never fall. It's falling apart, man. Like the, the second largest contributor to the European project is leaving. That's enormous. And then you've got the rest of the European Union, like Poland, Hungary, and like Italy. They're, they're just they hate the European Union. Greece is totally fucking bankrupt, and they're just getting bail after bail. It's like the, this whole project is on its last legs. I don't know what they think staying in there is going to be good for. I think a, like, lot, a lot of them feel like we're going to sort of up some sort of anchor and then we're going to be kicked out into sea. I mean, they don't they don't tend to appreciate we're not really leaving Europe. We're just sort of, <laughs> we're sort of leaving the fan club. Well, I mean, if possible, we could go down a few degrees uh, so we get a bit more sun. Yeah, that'd be nice, uh, wouldn't it? Bonus. Yeah, get, yeah a bit, bit to the west of France. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. This... this wild fear that and you can tell no one believes it no one reacts to it like oh we're going to run out of water they're going to be soldiers on the streets and everyone's like all right you know come on no one thinks we're going to run out of water i'm like owen jones from the garden the other day oh well god after brexit you know we we need immigrants to run our health care no we we can have health care even if even if no one in the world decided everyone in the world was like you know what don't like Britain. We're not going to go there. We would still be able to train enough people to run our healthcare. We would just change the focus of our recruitment driving. I mean, like the idea that we can't run this thing on our own is crazy. With, a, with like the fifth or sixth largest economy, we're going to be fine. Everyone, this is going to look, be looked at as the Y2K bug. This is what it's going to be looked like. Uh, in, yes, in the, I said the same thing. It reminds me of the Millennium Bug uh, yeah. Yeah, fiasco and all the hysteria surrounding that. Talking of Owen Jones, I mean, he, he feels to me like if he was to create a video game with the far left final boss in it, it, it kind of he kind of fit the mould of Owen Jones. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you saw the other day, he, he wrote an article in The Guardian where he was encouraging his fellow LGBT people to be more supportive of Muslims. Wow, really? Yeah. That's very progressive of him. And I, I sort of suggested that maybe he'd want to uh, go and knock on the door of, of a few mosques and see if that sentiment was, recipro- was reciprocated in any way, but um, he didn't get back to me, strangely. I think, that, I think there's only one gay imam in Europe. Um, I, I talked about him the other day. He's in France. I think he's the only gay one. There might be, maybe there are a few others. But it's it's very interesting how the gay imams have to exist in Europe, isn't it? Yes, that they're not spreading yeah. the uh, the fabulous world under Sharia, are they? No, yeah. it's really really strange strange turn of events. But I mean, I guess I have an Islamophobe's interpretation of Islam. Um, in in my view, Islam is capable of doing wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How's to put it? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree, and um, I mean, obviously, most people in the country share that view. Otherwise, you know, they convert, which they don't seem very keen on doing. True. Where do you where do you stand on the uh, the ban the burqa thing? I'm I'm a, I'm a liberal, so I I don't think we should be telling women what to wear publicly. But I think anywhere you can't enter with a like a, a you know a bicycle helmet or a balaclava, you shouldn't be able to enter with a burqa. So you know, banks, petrol stations, things like that. Uh, but I think outright banning it is uh, is a bad move. But I think we should be more critical of it, especially in uh, the you know the feminist <laughs> the <laughs> feminist response to this is is purely laughable. You'd think you know if you if there was any other culture on the planet 
pressurizing some in some instances you know under violence or the threat of violence pressurizing them to cover up and uh, accusing them of being immodest if they didn't capitulate you'd think that'd be a primary issue on the feminist agenda but not only is it not on the feminist agenda they actively support it it seems like some strange parallel universe yeah it's it's bizarre how conservative islam is and feminism is just like well i mean this is all about modesty <laughs> Would you would you ban the burqa? Would you put legislation into ban it? I I, I I've, I've struggled with this question quite a lot. Actually, I struggle. I'm very much I'm very much in the same position as you there. Like, and I think that what you propose is a fine compromise. Um, I I don't like the idea of the government intervening in this way, obviously, because I'm a liberal as well. Um, and I think that it is a fine compromise. Say, in, in situations where you are otherwise not allowed to cover your head, then you're not allowed to wear one. I think it's totally acceptable. Um. There are people who do want to go as far as France and Denmark, though, and several Middle Eastern countries as well. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with it, but honestly, if it happened, I don't think I'd lament it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'd protest too vehemently. Um, yeah. And mm-hmm. I, you know, that's an admission, but uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't sign a petition to have it banned either. Mm, no, well, yeah, you know, well, I don't, I don't even know how I feel about because, like, there, there's a part of me that really dislikes it on a cultural level because. British culture is very trust based. I mean, we we're used to seeing one another's faces. You know, this isn't. It's unusual for someone to cover their face, and when they do, you think, "Oh, that person's up to no good," you know. And so, I can see the argument for the cultural reasons. Like, it's it's deeply inconsiderate, in my opinion, to wear to wear something like that. And I I find it objectionable on that ground. And I. Uh, you know, I'm not saying ban everything, but like, as my personal opinion, I find that really objectionable. Yeah, it's, it's equally annoying as well. Like you pointed out before, it's very conservative in this country, Islam. But not only is it very conservative, and uh, non-Muslims are actually rewarding this conservative interpretation by, you know, championing it as the most authentic one. So yeah. you know, nobody's pointing out the the fact that actually that. To wear that garment, it's actually quite an extreme interpretation of the text. Yeah, that's kind of an extreme bit of dogma you'd have to enact there to to live your life like that. People are just assuming that stand. They're sort of looking at the Westboro Baptist Church version of Islam and saying that's the one. That's fine. Well, I completely agree with you, and I think that's something they they are totally refusing to over, to to look at because, like you say, like you've got these just highly conservative and extremely like literal interpretations of islam um they're not they're not following the lesser jihad obviously they're following the greater jihad but you have to ask yourself like how would it be different if isis took over this area you know all the women are in, no no but seriously all the women oh, yeah. are in this thing you know and and like there are accounts from people from syria various places in syria who describe what it was like under isis because under under assad's regime it's actually a lot more liberal um and so, like, you know, they, they under Assad, they don't have to wear the niqab and all this sort of stuff. But under, under ISIS, they do, and then they have to be at certain places at certain times. The only thing that's missing is the sort of arbitrary violence of ISIS. But the, the daily regime is essentially the same. So it's just like, you know, how are these people going to argue against ISIS? They're, they're not. They, it's a literal interpretation. They're just not in favor of violence. It's like, okay, great, but... Do we have to help proliferate and treat as normal the most extreme version of this? You know, it's it's mad. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if if it can't start with criticism, where can it start with? And unfortunately, it's become one of those areas in polite society, you know, where it's very difficult to put your hand up and say, you know what, I, you know what, I don't really think Islam is the religion of peace. I think there's some very <laughs> serious problems, and then yeah. that that tends to ruin any dinner party I'm at. I don't know about you. Oh, it ruins every dinner party on that. No. Yeah, <laughs> no, but no, but yeah, it's 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 wild how we can't talk about these things. And I, I this is this is why people say why you oppose political correctness because we can't talk about these things. You know, I'm I'm and I'm I'm big enough of a dick to do it. <laughs> I think that's a, a perfectly fine note to end on. So, so. yeah, I mean, you've, you're a busy man at the moment, so I really appreciate you coming on to talk to me for an hour. And uh, for what it's worth, I, I think the way 
patrons gone about this um, to you personally it's been pretty appalling so I'll be interested to see what comes next from this hopefully something positive hopefully and thank you very much for the support man I, re- I really appreciate it and that's honestly it's one of the reasons I made time because I, I, I've i been following your work for a very long time now like you know several years now and I've never seen a time where I haven't thought you've dealt with someone fairly um, and that's that's why when you asked I said yes cool man that's good to hear yeah uh, that's, what, that's what I try to do I mean you've got to I mean, you're not going to learn anything unless you make an effort to reach out to people that you might have some differences with. So I, I just don't understand why more people aren't doing it. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it would be a better world if we did. And I, I would have to troll less. So, <laughs> you know, the, the, the more the more conversations that happen that actually address the issues, the less I have to troll everyone. Everybody That's, wins. Yeah, exactly. Everybody wins. Thank you for listening to the Godless Spellchecker podcast. The podcast is a one-man operation, producing my spare time away from my day job, and I love making it for you. If you enjoy what you hear, please consider lending some support. The show is entirely listener-supported, I don't sell anything, I don't run ads, and uh, given the alternative and unpopular focus of my content, it's very unlikely to find a sponsor. So, there are a number of ways you can support and chip in and, and help improve the show and give me more time to produce more content. You can become a patron supporter and pledge a monetary amount per month or per episode by visiting patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker. If you can't lend monetary support right now, don't worry, there's other ways you can help the podcast too. You can share it on your various social media networks or take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to it. Your support is massively appreciated. Thank you. Think we've all learned something here today?